Thank you. Uh, I would like to first invite all of you to take a quick moment and really think about home. Feel what it feels like to be home, whatever that means for you. Maybe it's your house or being home in your community or home in your country and how it makes you feel safe and connected. And now imagine if somebody told you that there was a good chance that that home that was so vitally important to you was going to disappear forever and that you could never return there. I'd like to read a poem that is essentially that story. This was written by a young woman from the Marshall Islands as she is watching sea level rise. It is the end of the poem, Tell Them, by Kathy Jitnell Kitchener. Tell them about the water, how we have seen it rising, flooding across our cemeteries, gushing over seawalls, and crashing against our homes. Tell them what it's like to see the entire ocean level with the land. Tell them we are afraid. Tell them we don't know of the politics or the science, but tell them we see what's in our own backyard. Tell them some of us are old fishermen who believe that God made us a promise. Some of us are more skeptical of God, but most importantly, tell them we don't want to leave. We never wanted to leave. And we are nothing without our islands. When I read those words for the first time, I felt like she was speaking to me. Donna, tell them, please tell them, we're in trouble. And she's right, because for the first time in recorded history, we could see the loss of entire island countries off the face of the earth due to sea level rise caused by global warming. For these countries and their cultures, it is an existential threat born of a problem they didn't create. It is a serious case of environmental injustice in which the least responsible, most vulnerable countries are paying the most immediate and highest price of a warming planet. Imagine if it was your home your country. It's difficult for us here. We're relatively isolated from the impacts of sea level rise. But I'm here to tell you that although the countries that are facing the most immediate problems are 6,000 miles away in the Pacific Ocean, that we will feel the impacts directly here in Northwest Arkansas. You see, we have the largest population in the continental United States of people from the Marshall Islands. Between four and 6,000 Marshallese people have chosen to come here in search of better education and employment and healthcare opportunities. And although they've made that choice, the nearly 60,000 friends and families that remain in the, at their home in the Marshall Islands, may not have that choice. They may be forced to migrate. And we know enough about migration streams to know that because we have this network here in our community, that it will be a very attractive destination for people that may be forced to flee rising seas. Because when you know people in a place that alleviates the social and economic costs, of migrating. And so that puts us in a unique position. We could be one of the first host communities to sea level rise refugees, people who can never go home. We will see the faces of climate change right here. 
It's a situation that raises all kinds of questions. It's unprecedented. We have never had to consider the loss of entire countries. Does a country remain a country with no land? Or does it simply cease to exist? And if so, what of the government and the, and the people and their culture? What is to become of them? And who's to protect them? What about their human rights? For me, the questions that are really driving me today are how can we prepare to be a shining example of a host community if, in fact, we get thousands and thousands of more Marshallese people, some of which may not want to have left their homeland? How can we create a sustainable and equitable community so that all of our citizens have equal access to the resources they need to succeed. <clears throat> I, I suggest that we will serve as an example for a host community because this is not an isolated incident. Although the low-lying countries in the Pacific Ocean are at the most immediate threat, there are 700 million people that live in low elevation coastal zones across the earth. 700 million people. That as sea level rise, they will begin to have to move and find new communities to which they can relocate. I'm encouraged by the potential of our community to set a great example because when Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans, we were flooded with refugees. And what I saw was beautiful. People opened their homes to perfect strangers. They donated clothes and money and their time and their efforts to help rebuild New Orleans. And we were a, such a strong foundation for a lot of these people that many decided to stay here in Northwest Arkansas. And so what we typically see, though, is with a rapid onset disaster like a hurricane or tornado, that hits, people are in trouble, and we react and we help because humans want to help other humans in trouble. We, it, com it comes naturally to us in so many situations. But what I'm here to do is to put it on your radar that we have a slow onset disaster that we need to think about, and that is sea level rise. The impacts won't be felt immediately. This is a creeper disaster that we have to prepare for, and we've got time. We don't have to be reactive. We can be proactive. And so we've got several courses of action. At the global level, it goes without saying, we have got to continue our fight against climate change. The snail's pace at which the powers that be are moving to address the situation is absolutely unacceptable when there are people facing the loss of their entire country. Sometimes we feel a little helpless, but we can at least take some responsibility and reduce our footprint. It's a start. And we also need to consider legislation at the local, state, national, and international level to protect environmental refugees. We have treaties in place that protect political and religious refugees, but not environmental refugees. And the future in the future, there will be many, many people on the move. Some may be even stateless if their country completely disappears. And they deserve the protection of their human rights. And here at the local level, there are many things that we can start doing to be proactive. We have this unique insight to the population of the Marshallese and the ability to anticipate potentially thousands more coming. And so the first key thing that we need to do is understand them and their culture and where they come from. 
because it's with that cultural respect and understanding that we can work to create an equitable community for everybody. The Marshall Islands are located about halfway between Australia and Hawaii in the Pacific Ocean. Their culture is a matrilineal one in which land is handed through mothers' families. They are expert navigators and canoe builders. They are storytellers, family people, and they are known for their kind and gentle nature. Their country is comprised of five islands and 29 coral atolls, and each of those atolls are comprised of dozens and dozens of small islets strung together like a pearl necklace surrounding a lagoon. To put it into perspective for you, the total land area of the Marshall Islands is 70 square miles, and it is spread out over 822,000 square miles of ocean. It would be like taking the area the size of Fayetteville or Washington, D.C., chopping it up into over 1,000 pieces and stringing those pieces together into 29 pearl necklaces and flinging them out over an expanse of ocean the size of Mexico. And that is how they sit in the Pacific Ocean. They are isolated from other countries, and they are isolated from atoll to atoll, and it increases their vulnerability. And there's no elevation to speak of. This is the international airport. The average elevation of the Marshall Islands is two meters high. The second most populated community of Ebi is an average of two meters high. But the capital of Majuro, which has almost half of the population, is one meter high. And the projections for sea level rise to the year 2100 are at least a meter. However, scientists are recognizing that that is probably an underestimation based on the rates of rise and the acceleration that we are seeing today. So they are incredibly vulnerable. And long before inundation becomes the final problem, they are seeing increasing flooding from king tides and storm surges. Their coasts are eroding away. Their, their freshwater lens is being infiltrated by salt water. Their environment is getting battered and degraded over time, and the habitability will reduce. <clears throat> and we can't talk about the Marshall Islands without talking about the nuclear history. We invaded... In 1944, ousting Japanese occupiers. And then we proceeded from 1946 to 1958 to test 67 atmospheric nuclear bombs in that country. Averaged out, we tested 1.6 Hiroshima bombs per day for 12 years in that country. We moved people off of Bikini Atoll to keep them safe. We told them that this was for the benefit of mankind and that God wanted them to do it and that it was safe and that they could return back to Bikini Atoll after the testing. The largest test, the Castle Bravo shot, was equivalent to 1,000 Hiroshima bombs. And on the day of that test, the atmospheric conditions changed and fallout blew all over and rained down on Marshallese people. They didn't know what it was. They thought it was snow and played in it. The radiation sickness, the cancer, the jelly babies born without bones, and the destruction to the environment has left a lasting legacy of vulnerability for these people. But as a result, of this testing, we entered into the Compact of Free Association in 1986, in which we offered monetary reparations for the damages caused by this testing, also granting sovereignty to the country and opening our borders so that the Marshallese people could come and work 
in the United States indefinitely as non-immigrant status, as non-immigrants, uh, without need of, of the typical visas and other paperwork required of a typical immigrant. However, they are ineligible for Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security, even though they come here and work and pay taxes, like the rest of us. But knowing a little bit about these people and their rich and beautiful culture and the diversity they add to our community can help us move forward to create this equitable place, a strong community where we can all work together. Let's make sure our school system has enough resources for Marshallese students coming from a storytelling culture to a test-taking culture. Make sure they can succeed because they are the future of our community. Let's open a, a cultural resource center to protect what may very well be an endangered culture if their islands disappear. Let's inspire young entrepreneurs to recognize the talents and the assets that these people bring to our community. I'd like to invite my friend, the Honorable Carmen Chong Gum, to join me for the conclusion of my speech. She is the Consul General of the Marshall Islands and has an office in Springdale where she works really hard. And I know that I've been a part of the problem of global warming. I drive my car, I fly in airplanes, I turn on my lights and use my air conditioner. But I never intended for people to possibly lose their country. And I don't think any of us have. And so what we can do now is be agents of change in our communities to try to alleviate some of the problems that may result from this devastating unintended consequence so that when we look into the faces of climate change in our community, let them look back and see a face of change in you because we are all in this together. Thank you.